expand our imagination. And welcome to Washington Unplugged. Bob Schieffer here. Well, President Obama drew some big crowds at campaign events uh, in Ohio over the weekend, but uh, most of the analysts say it's still going to be an uphill fight for Democrats. Can they keep control of the Senate and the House? Well, National Journal's Major Garrett is going to join us today to talk about it. He's come up with uh, what he calls a uh, midterm opportunity map. For House Democrats. We'll see what that's all about. CBS's Rita Braver has a, a profile of the woman at the heart of the Democrats' campaign to keep the House, Nancy Pelosi. She'll talk to us about some of the behind the scene details on her interview with the speaker that was on Sunday morning over the weekend. And we're going to close today with a story from Cheryl Atkinson on the people funding the Tea Party movement, and they're not all who you've been told they are. Uh, but first to Major Garrett, you had a big piece uh, in National Journal, Garrett. You call it the kind of a backdoor plan for Democrats because there's no question, uh, I think the conventional wisdom is, everybody thinks that uh, the Democrats uh, are going to lose control in the House. Uh, the Senate may be a little better news for them there, but uh, it looks pretty bleak for them in the House. So do you think they can actually keep the House? I don't think they can keep the House, and that's not my opinion. That's a review of the race-by-race -race polling data, money raised so far, money available. Now, in some cases, races are tight where Democrats have more of their own money to spend. The candidates have outraised their Republican challenger. But these outside groups the Republicans have put up and stood up in the last two or three months are going to put their own money in those races, equalizing that money advantage. And the momentum and the energy, both Tea Party and otherwise, Republicans and independent voters mean more seats are up for grabs. Charlie Cook, who is related to National Journal, has 91 toss-up seats in the House. 84 of them are occupied by Democrats. When you look at a map like that and the numbers that way, remember, Republicans only need net 39 seats to regain yeah. control of the House. The numbers work against Democrats across the board. But that doesn't mean there are not targets of opportunity. And if the Democrats, by some low-level miracle, hold the House, it will be because they have picked up Republican seats where Republicans were not paying attention. Well, where are the Republican seats? They're not that many, up? but a couple of, I can say... And Republicans and Democrats agree have pretty much already been put in the Democratic column. Delaware is that large seat formerly held by Mike Castle, who was defeated in that Republican senatorial primary by Christine O'Donnell. The Democrats going to win that seat. Louisiana's second congressional district, kind of an unusual Republican win over a scandal-tainted William Jefferson, a Democrat. That seat is probably going to go back to the Democrats. But let's look at a seat the Democrats thought a couple of three months ago would be a sure win for them. Hawaii's first congressional district. Oh, really? That race is very competitive, very tight. They haven't put that away yet. That's a bad sign for Democrats. There are other opportunities. Illinois' 10th congressional district, Mark Kirk, is running for the Senate. That's an open seat. The Democrats running 11 to 10 points ahead there. That's a target of opportunity. Same thing in California 3, a very tight race. Dan Lundgren is a very familiar figure in Republican Party politics. He survived in 08, the toughest race he's ever had. But this year he's got another tough race against a self-funding Indian American first generation physician there, a Democrat. Democrats think they could pick that seat up there. There's about seven seats Democrats think they could pick up if everything breaks their way, and they're going to need every single one of those seats to hold on. Well, let's just talk a little bit about what the president's talking about out on the campaign trail. Here's uh, part of what he said at one rally this weekend. I understand that some of you, when you think back, you know, election night looks so good. Inauguration day, Beyonce was singing. <laughs> Bono was up there. Everybody had a good... Good feeling. Well, of course, that everybody had a good feeling. Question. Now what? What? Yeah. what happened to Barack Obama? Every midterm election, you generally think that the party that's in the White House is probably going to lose some seats. Sure. Uh, in in the Congress, that's that's just sort of the way it always is. But it looks really bad for Democrats, and I think a lot of Democrats think it's because of Barack Obama. What the numbers happened? the numbers were against Democrats to begin with. I wrote a piece two weeks ago for National Journal. Where Chris Van Hollen in February of 2009, this is just a couple of weeks after the massive inauguration the president just referred to there, telling Democrats we could lose 30 seats in the next election. Just because there were so many swing districts that Democrats had won in 2006 and 2008, that Republicans were going to charge back and try to get. So the Democrats knew the numbers were against them. But if the Republicans win 60 seats in this, more than 50, take back the House by a substantial margin, then the X factor will be the president. His agenda, and his inability to tell and communicate to the country what he's been doing and why.
The president conceded that in this very lengthy interview with the New York Times Sunday Magazine and Peter Baker, who we both know very well, mm -hmm. saying, you know, maybe my campaign rhetoric was a bit over the top. Maybe promising all these grand things and suggesting they could be done, if not instantaneously, with a lot less difficulty than we've encountered was a bit much. The other problem for the president, I think, is the country's still getting used to and sorting through its first African-American president. We don't like to talk about that in, in public very often, but America's still growing accustomed to this. And the people who thought, maybe I'll give this guy a chance, are having buyer's remorse more rapidly, I think, on a policy and a politics basis than the White House ever anticipated. They thought those votes for the president were locked in and golden for the midterms and the reelect. And they've discovered, to their dismay, that they were not. Well, the interesting thing to me is the disaffection on the left side of his own party. Uh, uh, young people seem sort of disappointed. Uh, I think uh, the expectations were so high, he said, I'm going to change things, and I think many of them think that, frankly, he just didn't. Three big issues stick out on the left. Two could be anticipated, and one could not. The one that could not was health care and the public option suddenly becoming the definitional yes or no if you support the president and what he accomplished. Because there's no public option, the left is antagonized and aggrieved. Well, the president never ran on public option. He never promised that. That became sort of an add-on as the health care debate became elongated. The White House could not foresee that one. But on Guantanamo Bay and gays in the military, meaning don't ask, don't tell, the president campaigned on both, made hard and fast promises on both, and both are still undelivered. Those are two areas where the White House says, look, we can't get everywhere. We've tried our best. But on don't ask, don't tell, when the president says, as he did last week, I want an orderly process and Congress needs to weigh in, be a much more Republican Congress next year. That's basically telling those who care about that issue, forget about it. I'm not here to help you because I'm going to turn it over to Congress. And everyone knows the Congress to come is going to be far more hostile on that issue than the Congress the president was dealing with. All right. Major Garrett, well, thanks a lot for some very good reporting. Your piece in the National Thank Journal you. is uh, very incisive. It brings up a lot of stuff nobody's talked about. Thank yet. you, Paul. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, uh, this weekend, um, uh, Rita Braver had a big piece on the Sunday morning broadcast uh, with Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She got incredible uh, access for the piece. So uh, let's just take a look at a clip from uh, that piece to start this. Well, she's from Baltimore, so you know we we know how to we we know about effective leadership uh, in in the state of Maryland for sure. I just happen to disagree <laughs> with the effectiveness of it, but no, she's been very effective at, at at ramming through an agenda that the American people does doesn't want. He's talking, of course, about health care. We took an idea that was very popular, and uh, if we shoved it down anybody's throat, it was the insurance companies. But it's been six months since it's passed, yes. and people haven't started to like it anymore. It's about even now. I think the polls today show it about even. And when you think people they'll like see it the more? benefits, oh, once they know. There is, however, a certain irony in the fact that the health care plan Pelosi considers her crowning achievement could be her party's undoing in November. But true to form, Nancy Pelosi is having none of it. Don't you worry that maybe you could end up, instead of being one of the most famous speakers in history, to be just a footnote? I'm not a footnote. I'm the first woman uh, speaker of the House, and we passed the most uh, comprehensive health insurance reform. Uh, I, I didn't come here about me. I came here about policy and the issues, and I wouldn't... Uh, what, are you saying, would I rather not have passed the health care bill so I could keep this office? Never. <laughs> Never. All right. Well, Rita, you had incredible access for that piece. I would also congratulate you on getting Michael Steele on national television. You know, he didn't go on TV much anymore since he'd been in uh, all the troubles that he found himself in uh, over the last year, even though he's the national chairman of his party. So I have he, to give you an extra point on that. He's found a new calling in driving around the country in a fire Pelosi bus. And yeah, that's kind and, of what and, he's been doing the last uh, couple months. The party seems very happy to have him on that <laughs> bus, if I, if I may say so. Well, what what about, uh, let's talk about Nancy Pelosi. Uh, she may be out of a job here pretty soon. Uh, she seemed very upbeat when you talked to her. You know, her, you can imagine that she has to be the uh, captain, even if it's the Titanic, she's got to go down with the ship. So she is insisting over and over again that the polls are wrong, the pundits are wrong, that their own uh, charting shows that Democrats 
are going to do quite well in the election. Now, she may be whistling in the wind, and she's also going because she's wanted in more places where Democrats are doing okay. But look, there's no question, and we showed earlier in the piece, that Democrats are turning against her. A lot of them are not only running campaign ads, distancing themselves from her, but they are coming out and saying, I would not vote for her for speaker again if the Democrats keep the majority. That, that's very interesting. But of course, you've you got to be a tough customer uh, to be the speaker, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, because always they use the speaker generally uh, as the object of everybody's uh, anger. When Newt Gingrich was there, I mean, he went after other people, then people went after Newt Gingrich. So that, that just kind of comes with the job, but it can't be easy or fun. Well, she is incredibly tough. That is the word steely was the word that so many people used yeah. about her when I was reporting on this story. Uh, but she's an odd combination, Bob, because here she is as somebody who is the Speaker of the House, but she defines herself as mother and grandmother, says she likes being grandmother of eight more than being Speaker of the House. And I think a lot of people don't realize that she didn't even run for Congress until she was 47 years old. And she told me, I once I decided to run, I decided to win, and I knew how to win, and that was how I helped the Democrats take over the House. It, of course, this is all in her blood. Her dad was a congressman, was the mayor of Baltimore, and uh, there's no tougher politics than on the streets of Baltimore. Without a doubt. And she is ready. I, I, I said to her at one point, did you ever really say, because I read this quote, that if somebody tears your face off, you have to be ready to tear their face off. And she said, well, I don't think I said that, but I said, if somebody punches you, you punch them right back. And that's what she's like. She is very, and at the same time, 70 years old, immaculately turned out all the time. Uh, and she even admits that since she started wearing pearls so much, the pearl industry has told her that they're doing very well. <laughs> All right. Well, Rita Brever is a fine piece, and thanks for coming by and talking to us about it. Finally today, a report now from CBS News' Cheryl Atkinson on Tea Party donors. She has found it actually a lot of small donors that are chipping in, not just a few anom uh, anonymous big donors, as uh, we've sometimes uh, heard uh, reporting. Here's her report. When it comes to Tea Party candidates, small donors are emerging as a major force. Their contributions, $200 or less, are arriving in mass numbers. The small donor trend for Tea Party years is unprecedented. Those small donors are helping candidates pay for anti-establishment ads like this. This is a brontosaurus. This is a political insidosaurus. Typically, Senate candidates get a relatively small percentage, no more than 20% of their funds, from small donors. But just look at some of the latest numbers available for some Tea Party favorites. Small donors filled about one-third of the campaign chests of Pat Toomey and Marco Rubio, nearly half for Christine O'Donnell and Rand Paul, and more than half of the early donations given to Joe Miller and Sharon Angle. The Tea Partiers are getting a fair share from big donors, too. Their top supporter is the fiscally conservative Club Sharon for Growth, Angle, which is paying for, for ads like this. Club for Growth PAC is responsible for the content of this advertising. Who is the muscle behind the Club for Growth? The Club for Growth gets a lot of its contributions from retirees. And these are not your average pensioners. These are people who are uh, CEOs, former CEOs, or, or uh, leaders in industry. The Club for Growth has been around 11 years and supported Republicans long before there was a Tea Party. This year, its top three beneficiaries are Tea Party-backed Republicans running for Senate. That includes nearly $700,000 for Pat Toomey. Until last year, he happened to be president of the Club for Growth. But if it's small donors who are setting apart these midterms, it's not exclusive to the Tea Party. Senator Russ Feingold, a Democrat, has raised 42 percent from people giving $200 or less. His opponent? A Tea Party-backed candidate named Ron Johnson, who's become his own big donor. He's injected $4.4 million of his own fortune into his campaign. Cheryl Atkinson, CBS News, Washington. And that is it for Washington Unplugged today. Join us here every day on CBSNews.com. I'm Bob Schieffer, and I hope you have a very good day.